Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session in American English Live Series 17. We are so excited that each of you are here with us today. We are going to get started in a moment. And my name is Kate, and I'll be with you, along with my colleague behind the scenes, Heather, who will be today's moderator, helping answer your questions and responding to your comments during the session. Let's begin today with these wonderful audience comments from our most recent webinar, Building and Sustaining a Cultural Culture of Belonging with Lindsay Lyons. So we have Diana in Mexico who wrote, thanks a lot for the session. It's really helpful to have more strategies to build belonging in a classroom. I'll be using the Values Appreciation Circle at least once a week to get a better relationship among students. Wonderful. And Raba in Morocco says, Thank you for this fruitful session. I do believe that building up a sense of belonging among students paves the way to enhance their learning and contributions in the classroom. Wonderful. And finally, Anna in Russia wrote, when you have a very strict schedule, sometimes it's difficult to keep in mind that students may feel uncomfortable expressing their thoughts and emotions. This session helped me with these techniques, not only in emotional situations, but for academic purposes. Sharing ideas between teachers is a great opportunity for self-development. Wonderful, thanks for sharing those comments, everyone. We love to see our teacher participants actively engaged in professional development, so please continue to share your thoughts using the end of session quiz form or by emailing your ideas to AmericanEnglishWebinars at FHI360.org. We may feature one of your comments during the next session. <coughs> and throughout series 17, we will be exploring the themes of critical thinking and inclusive practices in ELT. We hope you are able to use the practical ideas we share. And here's what to expect today. The session is about 60 minutes long. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. Please share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. When our session comes to a close, you'll have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the webinar, we'll share a link in the comments. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. And once you've successfully done so, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. And before we begin, we wanted to let you know about the latest English Teaching Forum. Check out volume 61, number two, to find strategies for listening to diverse English voices and podcasts. Learn how to contextualize teacher training through needs analysis. Read ideas on working with upper class students as teaching assistants. Discover how to organize a writing picnic and much more. Visit the link being shared with the moderator now to view this edition of English Teaching Forum. And now for today's webinar, Plural Lingualism and Translanguaging Strategies for Language Teachers and Students. Students bring a variety of linguistic and cultural backgrounds to their study of language. Unfortunately, in many classrooms, language teachers and learners often view students' first language, L1, as a potential problem or a stumbling block on the road to successful language learning. This session will explore strategies to help teachers and learners make use of their current knowledge as they build their linguistic repertoires. The plural lingual approach being presented treats students' backgrounds as assets, is linguistically and culturally inclusive, and is a model of culturally responsive teaching as it connects their previous experiences to the new language they are learning. The webinar will demonstrate how including students L1 in the language classroom offers the potential for innovative and nuanced communication in students both L1 and L2. Participants will reflect on their own language learning experiences as they are presented with activities that can be adapted for students of all ages and levels. And now we're pleased to introduce our presenter, Chris Hastings. Chris Hastings is a new Regional English Language Officer, or RELO, and is currently working as a Regional Program Officer for East Asia and the Pacific here in Washington, DC. Chris has spent the past 20 years teaching English. Before joining the RELO Corps, 
Chris was an assistant professor of languages and literature at Southwest Tennessee Community College in Memphis, Tennessee, a U.S. Department of State English Language Fellow in Russia and China, and an English language specialist in Iraq and Pakistan. In addition to teaching in Colombia, Brazil, South Korea, and Saudi Arabia, he was the educational programs coordinator for an immigrant service provider in Texas and led nonprofit surface service projects in Panama and Brazil. Chris earned an MA in TESOL and a PhD in Applied Linguistics from the University of Memphis. In his free time, he enjoys running, playing guitar, and cooking. Welcome, Chris. It's wonderful to have you here with us today. Thanks, Kate. It's great to be here. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, as you just heard from Kate, I've spent the past two decades teaching English in diverse linguistic contexts from Colombia to Brazil, South Korea to Saudi Arabia, China to Russia, and in the United States. Um, and my passion for teaching was, was born out of a love for language learning. It was not born out of a love for English. Um, it was a fascination with other languages and cultures that brought me in. And during my travels, I've had the experience studying and struggling with several languages. But in each place I've taught, I've found that my teaching was most effective when I was actively studying my students' languages. And this personal experience sparked my interest in the teaching strategies that we're going to be discussing today. In this presentation, we're going to challenge traditional language teaching approaches and explore innovative strategies that place multilingualism at their core. We'll discuss how to leverage students' existing linguistic knowledge to enhance their language learning journey and demonstrate the potential for including students' first language in the classroom. As more countries adopt English as a medium of instruction and learning through second or additional languages becomes more prevalent, the need for such strategies is increasing. So let's dive into this fascinating topic and reflect on our own language learning experiences as we consider adaptable activities for all ages and levels. So we're gonna begin by asking you to reflect a little bit on your teaching context. What is your school's stance on using the student's first language or a shared local language? Yeah, let us know everybody. So what is the policy at your school or institution or what are you told by administrators or your colleagues that you're supposed to do in an English language classroom? Are you supposed to, are you able to use the student's first language? Is it an English only context? What is either, what does your school think or what does the administration think? We'd love to hear from you, everybody. So we know that in a lot of contexts, there are English only policies, but many others um, do not have that. Let's see, Lorien says using the L1 is prohibited. Imran says they're bilingual at their school, so they use maybe the home language and English, wonderful. Miriam says we keep L1 to a minimum. Marcel says our pedagogical instructors forbid the use of students L1 in an EFL setting. Tom says it's solely English language in Nigeria. Miriam is, says bilingual. Sabina also says bilingual is encouraged. And I'll just do a couple of more. We are not allowed to use native language by our supervisors. That is from Yusuf. And da, 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 da. but we are ordered to speak in only English. Uh, we are ordered to speak in only English, but there is no strict rule. Whatever language we are comfortable sharing, our thoughts is used from Nor. Interesting, wonderful responses, everybody. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. We've heard a range of, of responses here though. So we've heard everything from exclusive use of English in the classroom to English only. And the logic behind this is it's maximizing exposure to English, um, but it's, it's also good for us to recognize that their first language can actually enhance comprehension and learning. Um, saw some other people mentioning that they used it for classroom management. Um, and we can take it into teaching English as well. Um, I saw some bilingual approaches in there, which you know that demonstrates the value of having multiple languages. Um, all right, so moving forward. 
Today, we will explore two strategies to help us use the linguistic diversity of our classrooms to our students' advantage in learning English. These strategies, known as plurilingualism and translanguaging, encourage students' first languages or a shared local language to enhance English language learning. We'll discuss why these approaches are beneficial and how they can transform our classrooms into more inclusive and effective learning environments. We'll also share some practical tips and techniques for integrating these strategies into your teaching practice. Lastly, we'll explore some engaging activities that promote the use of multiple languages, helping students to connect their existing language skills with their new language learning. I aim to help you recognize and utilize the rich linguistic resources that you and your students bring to the classroom. All right, so we're gonna begin by defining these concepts, we're going to explore these two key concepts, plurilingualism and translanguaging. Plurilingualism, in simple terms, is the ability to use and switch between different languages depending on the situation or context. It's like having different tools in your toolbox and picking the right one for the job. Um, on the other hand, translanguaging is about blending different languages. It's like mixing the colors on a palette to create a unique painting. Both of these approaches celebrate the value of all languages and encourage their use in English language teaching classrooms. In academic li literature, plurilingualism and translanguaging are considered as separate but related concepts. However, for our purposes today, we will blend the ideas because they both help us to use the linguistic diversity of our students to enhance learning and bridge the gap between home languages and school languages. Our goal here is to teach English and foster a multilingual environment where all languages are valued and utilized. All right, so let's consider a few scenarios. In the first one, a student uses a shared uh, first language or a shared L1 to quickly explain a tricky English vocabulary item to a team member during a group work activity. What do you think about this one, Chris? I absolutely think that it's helpful. It allows the student to use all of the languages that they know, or what we would refer to as the full linguistic repertoire, to help them understand. It can lead to a deeper understanding of the vocabulary item, and it creates a more inclusive learning environment. All right, and so maybe some of you out there can re relate or understand some of these examples, or maybe you've seen them or considered them. So as we go through a few more, think about um, scenarios that you have seen that might be similar. Let's see. So um, what about students having an off-topic L1 side chat during a group project? What do you think about that one? That one's definitely not as helpful. Uh, while these approaches value the use of all languages, off-topic chats could be distracting and they can distract from, uh, detract from the focus of the group project. Um, they don't contribute to the learning goals and they can disrupt the learning process. All right, let's take a look at another one. How about, could you consider, let's see, a teacher comparing a shared L1's grammatical organization pattern to that of English to show a difference between the two? That's definitely helpful. It can make an abstract grammatical concept more concrete and more relatable for a student. It can enhance their understanding of English grammar. All right, let's see. Finally, what about a student translating an entire English multiple choice question and its answers into a shared L1 for a partner during pair work? That's definitely not as helpful. It might lead to over-reliance on translation rather than encouraging the student to develop their English language skills. It's important that students are challenged to use and understand English, even if it's difficult at first. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. And I hope some of you could understand some of these examples as you're considering this topic today. Um, let's hear from you, everybody. What other benefits or what other ways might it be helpful, as we saw in these examples, to have students use their first language or shared local languages in the EFL classroom? So we saw a couple of helpful um, scenarios here. What other benefits or what other scenarios would it be helpful in? Let's see here.
What do you think, everybody? They can contrast the two languages from Nelida. Absolutely. They might be able to make those concrete example um, distinctions that Chris was mentioning. Very good. What other benefits would you suggest? It might help to explain a task or the game rules. Marcel says we can use the first language to help make instructions clear. They could relate it with learning English from Bisma. They could understand patterns between the two languages. They could be more participative and open in their classroom from Nikki. It can clear vagueness from Miriam. And students can be free to explain their ideas from Mohoyami. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jill. I saw some wonderful responses in there. I mean, so we can see that, you know, using a student's first language or having it available can help make students feel more comfortable and confident, which is crucial to learning. You know, when students uh, use their L1, they can be, feel validated and this could enhance their learning experience. Um, can also encourage peer learning and collaboration so students can use it together um, to help them understand and learn difficult topics. Um, one of the things that I think made this first appealing to me is that, you know, I was an, an English language, I was a language student first, and I've always had a curiosity of the languages that my students are speaking. And there's sort of the idea of me being a co-learner as well. You'll see this in the literature for translanguaging is the, the idea of the teacher learning from the students as well. And I think this facilitates that. Right, so if we're going to move forward, we're going to explore the benefits of plurilingualism and translanguaging in the language classroom. First, these approaches validate students' multilingual identities and experiences. For instance, in a classroom where students come from diverse language backgrounds, acknowledging and incorporating their first languages can make them feel seen and valued. Second, these approaches encourage students to draw on their entire linguistic repertoire or we can say use all of their language resources or all the tools in their toolbox or all the colors of their palette, um, as you see in the image, to enhance their learning. So imagine a scenario where a student is struggling to understand a complex concept. If they can discuss and explore this concept in their first language with a peer, they may grasp it more quickly and deeply. And third, these approaches bridge home and school languages, making learning more relevant and meaningful. For example, in a classroom where English is the language of instruction, but many students speak Spanish at home, comparing English and Spanish grammar can help students to understand English while valuing their home language. Fourth, these approaches foster the development of metalinguistic awareness and promote minority languages. In a multilingual classroom, students be can become more aware of how different languages work and interact, enhancing their language learning. Moreover, using minority languages in the classroom can help preserve and promote those languages. Finally, these approaches enhance students' vocabulary learning, plurilingual and pluricultural competence, cognition, criticality, and empathy. By using multiple languages in the classroom, students can learn a new vocabulary and context, they can understand how languages interact, and they can develop deeper understanding of different cultures. This can also enhance their cognitive skills, critical thinking, and empathy towards others who speak different languages. So in sum, plurilingualism and translanguaging offer many benefits that can enhance the language learning experience in diverse and meaningful ways. In our Wonderful, next section, and we have a really nice comment from Tammy who says, absolutely, the, the L1 is a tool to boost our acquisition of the new language. Glad to see this discourse in an EFL context, extremely pertinent. One challenge, of course, is teaching amid institutional constraints, as we touched upon a little bit earlier. Thanks so much for that wonderful comment, Tammy. Absolutely. Um, so in our next section, we will explore some practical tips and tricks for implementing plurilingualism and translanguaging in your classrooms. Now, we understand that every classroom is unique, and so are the challenges that you might face especially in schools with English-only policies. But remember, these approaches are about making use of the linguistic resources that your students already possess. Let's jump right in. Now, bef before we go into the tips and tricks, we'd like to hear from you. 
what challenges do you anticipate that you might face when implementing these approaches in your classrooms? If you would, please share your thoughts in the chat. Yeah, thanks. So what challenges might you face? As Tammy mentioned, the constraints from administration absolutely could be a definite constraint, but hopefully some of the ideas that are shared here today can help you to um, share some justification with your administrators or your colleagues. What other challenges might you face when you start using some of these approaches to using L1 in the classroom? What do you think, everybody? Okay, Maria says, offending the students who speak rare languages. Very interesting. So we definitely want to make sure that we are including all home languages um, in this approach. And Chris, might you might want to speak to that a little bit in a moment. But that definitely can be a tricky one when there are many, many languages represented in your classroom. Let's see, what's another challenge? Students might over rely on their use of L1 from Patricia. Um, one language can dominate the classroom from Grace. Yep, especially if you have more than one L1 for your students. One of those other, one of the dominant L1s might dominate the classroom. Um, Syed says, we're already using this approach, so no challenges, but some colleagues may degrade the idea or not think it's great. And then we have actually a real quick question for you, Chris, from Nalita. At what level is it okay to ask students just to use English in class, or how would you approach that? Um, yeah, at what level, or what do you think about not allowing students to use their mother tongue? Yeah, we've heard a sort of a range of, of, of answers here. You know, um, I think that it's an understandable concern that what people have often is that using too much of an L1 will discourage the English language use. But uh, the research in the literature tends to suggest that first languages actually enhance English language learning. Um, so it can provide a bridge to new concepts and vocabulary and make English more accessible. Of course, it's important not to over rely on it. Um, and I would argue that it, this can be applied at different levels. Um, for myself, for example, I, I, I came to language teaching first as a language learner. And so I've always viewed my students as those who could teach me. And obviously our conversations are gonna be different, whether it's a beginning level class or a high level class, but we can discuss more nuances between the languages that we share. Um, and you know, having the students teach me about those. Um, for those that are kind of concerned that it may take too much time or distract from the curriculum, the idea is just to integrate them into your existing curriculum without taking extra time. Like, so for example, uh, you could use your students' first language to explain some complex con uh, concepts or to facilitate group, group, group discussions. Um, for those who have different languages in the classroom, it's always sort of interesting to compare um, whatever the grammar topic or whatever the top or topic we're discussing in English and compare that with the various languages that are present in the room. It just gives us an opportunity to reflect on all of the languages that are present. Thanks. Yeah, we have a lot of great other ideas coming in, but we appreciate all of that feedback, everybody. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. And so we're going to move on to some tips to help get you started. Um, first, start small. You don't need to overhaul your entire teaching approach. You, know, you can gradually increase um, the strategic use of your students' first languages in your lessons. For instance, you could begin by allowing students to use their first language during a brainstorming session or a small group discussion, and that could help them feel more comfortable and confident with sharing their ideas, which would then be translated into English when they are sharing with the whole class. Second, make good use of visual aids and bilingual resources to help support understanding. For example, if you're teaching a new vocabulary word, you could use images, bilingual dictionaries, bilingual flashcards to help students understand the meaning in both English and their first language. This can enhance understanding and the retention of new vocabulary. You'll want to encourage peer support and collaborative learning. Students can learn a lot from each other, especially when they're allowed to use their first languages. Encourage students to work together on tasks and allow them to use their first languages during these activities. For instance, during a group 
project, students could discuss and plan their work in their first language before presenting it in English. This not only enhances their understanding, but fosters a collaborative and inclusive learning environment. Continuing with our tips, it's important to regularly communicate with parents and school administrators about your approach. Help them understand the benefits of using students' first languages in the classroom. For instance, you might hold a meeting with parents and school administrators to help explain the benefits of translanguaging and plurilingualism. You could share research on the benefits of these approaches and provide examples of how you plan to incorporate students' first languages in your lessons. This open communication can help alleviate any concerns and gain support. Next, try to incorporate culture and real world context into your lessons. This can make learning more relevant and engaging for your students. For example, if you're teaching English to Spanish speaking students, you might use a real world event like a Spanish holiday or festival as a context for a lesson. Students could then use both, in, both English and Spanish to research and present information about the event. This not only makes the lesson more engaging and relevant, but it also allows students to use their first language as a resource for learning English. And lastly, regularly reflect on and adjust your teaching practices. Remember that there's no one size fits all approach to teaching. What works best for one might not work best what might not work well for another. And so after implementing these approaches in your classroom, take time to reflect on what's working and what's not working. For example, you might find that a certain activities allow for more effective use of translanguaging than others. And based on your reflections, you can adjust your lessons to better support your students' language learning. This could involve incorporating more of the successful activities or modifying the ones that didn't work as well. And so now, as we have discussed a bit of the theory behind plurilingualism and translanguaging and the benefits of adopting these approaches, let's focus on the practical side. How can we implement these approaches in our classrooms? We will start by discussing the concept of a linguistic inventory, a tool that helps us as teachers understand the linguistic resources that our students bring to the classroom, and it helps our students understand themselves better. Then we'll explore practical activities that can be used to promote plurilingualism and translanguaging in the classroom. Know that these strategies can be adapted to fit different teaching contexts. So feel free to think creatively and modify these ideas to meet the needs of your students. So let's look at a practical activity you can use in your classrooms, the linguistic inventory. It is a reflective tool that encourages students to explore their language experiences and practices. It's a way for students to recognize the diverse linguistic influences in their lives and to understand the richness of their personal and community linguistic resources. It's an activity that includes identifying your language or languages, your feelings towards them, and the features of your personal language or your idiolect. By engaging in this activity, students can better understand their own linguistic identities and the value of their multilingual skills. In the following slides, we will discuss how to implement this activity in your classroom and its potential benefits. So let's take a look at the inventory, linguistic inventory activity, which reflects our English language experiences or our language experiences in practice. The tool is designed to help students gain perspective on their language practices and resources, and it can help us understand ourselves better as language learners and as teachers. It's an excellent way to start cultural conversations in the classroom and to learn more about your students' backgrounds. It can be a great starting point for discussions about dialects and different languages, helping students see English in a broader context. The linguistic inventory consists of several prompts. Students are asked to identify their first language, where they learned it, to list other languages that they speak and who taught them, discuss influences on their language use, and reflect on their feelings towards languages and dialects. They're also asked to consider whether the languages are positively or negatively marked and why, compare their language use with their family, their neighbors, their classmates, their community, and describe unique features of their personal language, 
and reflect on their beliefs about different forms of language. This activity is not about just about filling out a form. It's about self-discovery and understanding the richness of our linguistic experiences. It's about recognizing the value of our multilingual skills and how they influence our teaching and learning. After students complete their inventories, you can follow up with various activities. For instance, students could interview other English language learners to discover their perceptions of the English language and language learning. They could also interview family members about their languages, providing a deeper understanding of their linguistic backgrounds. Now, I will share one of my responses to one of the inventory items in a moment, and then Kate will share hers. After that, we'll invite you to share your responses to another item in the chat. And this is an opportunity for us to learn more about each other's linguistic experiences and to see the linguistic inventory in action. All right, so moving forward, English is my first language. And I was born in Chicago, so I first learned English in Chicago. And as a child, we moved to Memphis in the South, um, in the Southern United States. And so my feelings towards my Southern American English dialect, they're mixed because it can be negatively marked due to cultural stereotypes. But despite this, I've come to appreciate the familiarity and the phrases of Southern American English. I began studying Spanish at 14, but it wasn't until I started traveling and living in Latin America and I moved to Colombia that the language actually began to make sense for me. My Spanish language use was heavily influenced by my time in Colombia. I've also been studying Arabic intermittently for 15 years. Um, my Arabic language journey began with modern standard Arabic in the classroom, as it does for many. And then it was influenced by interactions with Saudi Arabian students where I taught, and most recently um, by my, my wife, who is from Lebanon. So I would consider my Arabic proficiency still high beginner at an A2 level, despite all of these years engaging with it. Um, what about you, Kate? I know that you've lived and taught abroad and you've studied other languages. So what do you think the biggest influence on your English was? Yeah, well, I would say, so I um, moved around a lot growing up in the United States, um, but I, there's, I sort of claim Wisconsin as home. That's where I went to high school. Um, but I already had, my accent was pretty well set before I was in high school. So I don't have as much of what we call the Midwest accent or the North mid North accent in the United States, but it still comes out sometimes. Um, but I would say moving around a lot kind of um, made my language sound a little bit different than maybe my mother's uh, English sounds. Um, but I still go back to that. And I too, as Chris, you were saying, have come to appreciate a lot of the familiar um, phrases, vocabulary, and the accent even um, of the Midwest dialect. Um, and then for my second language, I had the best teacher of my life in, in who inspired me to be a teacher in high school, who was my Spanish teacher. And she did a wonderful, wonderful job of teaching us Spanish and making it super fun and engaging and surrounding us with music and cultural culture, especially of Mexico, because that's where she had the most experience um, with the Spanish language. Um, so that was a big influence on me. And then living in Colombia definitely changed my perception of Spanish. And I learned so much about the different dialects and expressions and nuances that come with um, Colombian Spanish in all the different parts of that wonderful country. So those are some of my thoughts. Um, and I think we are going to um, move on to you as our audience. Thanks, Kate. So language is a dynamic and multifaceted tool that we adapt based on our environment and the people we interact with. We want to hear from you now. Think about your own language use in different contexts. How do you use language with your family versus how do you use it with your neighbors? How do you use it with your classmates? Do you use the same language or different languages with each group? Do you use different dialects or accents or different levels of formality when speaking to different groups? If you would, please take a moment to share your experiences in the chat 
And remember, there is no right or wrong answer here. We're just looking to understand the rich diversity of language use among our participants today. Yeah, thanks everybody. Go ahead and share. How would you compare your use of language between family, neighbors, and classmates? Please share in the chat box. Syed says, my mother language is Punjabi. The national language is Urdu. And the third language is English, but still I am a good speaker of English. I am sure of that, Syed. Thank you so much for sharing that. Let's see, Nelita says at home she uses Spanish and she says at work I use English. Absolutely. Akib says language profoundly influences my life. It allows me to connect with others, expand my knowledge and shape my perception of the world. Absolutely. What are some other comparisons you might make between family, neighbors and classmates? Let's see here. I mostly use English language with my friends and use Urdu with family and neighbors from Maham. Wonderful, thank you. I use both languages at home. Sometimes we do translingualism at home, wonderful. Franz says at home I use Quechua. Very interesting, very cool, thank you for sharing that. My mother language is Spanish. I teach English at an American school in Bolivia from Maria. And we will do one more. I use Punjabi at home, but uh, Idu with friends from Hafsa. Wonderful. So interesting, everyone. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. I like hearing. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like hearing that someone identified. You know, they're already doing it at home. This is uh, this is something that trans. You know, the multilingual speakers sort of naturally do in their own lives. Um, in neither one of our presentations did I see what language people speak to their pets at. I was thinking about my cat. And my wife speaks to him in Arabic and I speak to him in English. So even, even our cat is used to translanguaging. Um, so as we wrap up our discussion on the linguistic inventory, let's consider how we can adapt this tool to our unique teaching context. This inventory can be tailored to suit different student levels and different classroom environments. For instance, you might simplify the questions or use more visuals for younger learners or beginners. The linguistic inventory doesn't have to be a standalone activity. It can serve as a springboard for further language exploration activities. So for example, students could use their inventories to create language maps, conduct interviews, or engage in research projects about different dialects and languages inside and outside of their communities. There are various benefits to conducting a linguistic inventory. It enhances a student's self-awareness of their language practices, and it fosters respect for linguistic diversity. It can also serve as a powerful tool to introduce the concept of global languages and global Englishes, such as challenging the monolithic view of English and acknowledging the many varieties of the English language. And finally, the insights gained from linguistic inventory can be shared with school administrators. This could help advocate for a more inclusive language policy that values and utilizes students' diverse linguistic resources. I would like to turn this to you. How can you use the linguistic inventory information in your teaching? If you would share your ideas in the chat. Yeah, let us know everybody. How would you use the linguistic inventory information in your teaching, whether the inventory is from your students or from yourself, how would you use it? Let's see, a couple of other comments coming in from the inventory. My first language is Spanish. I'm from Mexico and I live on the border with Texas. So this helps me to study English. My kids were born in Texas. Their first language is English. So they teach me something new every day. Very diverse ideas there represented in your family. What else do you think, everybody? How can you use this linguistic inventory information in your teaching? You can... Let's see here. I like the idea of the map. Students can put a pin on their country and tell us about their L1 from Maria. Wonderful. You can incorporate culture into your lessons based on this linguistic inventory, absolutely. 
I'd use the linguistics English inventory in my role play sessions with my students and then hone presentation skills. Great idea. You can use mind maps and drawings from CED. Students will be more encouraged to share their amazing experiences from Muhammad, absolutely. And you can compare and contrast between cultures from Muhayima. Wonderful, thanks everybody for sharing. Wonderful, these are some, these are some great answers. Um, one of the ones I really liked hearing was our, was our participant from Mexico and on the border with Texas. One of the teachers that first sort of introduced the concept to me came from University of Texas at Rio Grande in Brownsville, the southernmost point in the US. And I remember her commenting that she was always part of both languages and separate from both languages because she was always mixing them, which I thought was pretty awesome. Um, but we can definitely use these to identify um, students who may need additional support or have different language barriers. We can use this to encourage students to reflect on their own language use. Um, and to promote student engagement. So one more or a couple more really quick comments that I just saw here. Uh, another way you can use this is to just to get to know your students. This is from Nelida. The very first day of class or when we talk about language, family and culture is when she would use it. And Patricia, Patricia says, I can integrate that activity in my linguistics class to profile students' cultural identity and the link with language. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. And, you know, for getting to know the students, this promotes, you know, student engagement. This this encourages them to be start part of the community and get a respect for the languages that are in the classroom. All right. So let's start with another activity, mapping one sociocultural network. So in this activity, students will create a visual representation of their social and cultural connections, including the languages spoken within these networks. This activity is a great way to help students recognize the diversity of their, their linguistic resources and understand how language use varies across different social contexts. Um, this activity can be high tech or it can be low tech. All you really need are paper, pens, and markers, um, but it not only enhances students' awareness of their own multilingualism, but it highlights the role of language in their social interactions. All right, so I think we're going to demonstrate mapping one's own social, social cultural network. Um, and we're going to um, demonstrate this by having you, Chris, um, share some of your ideas. So can you tell us about your linguistic and cultural connections? Absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, I was born in Chicago and raised in Memphis. So my first language is English. I studied Spanish in school and later traveled to Mexico and lived in Colombia and Brazil. So I've got a strong connection with the Spanish language and with Latin American culture. Um, I met my wife in the Middle East and my son was born in Saudi Arabia. So I've got connections there. Um, I taught English for two decades and I have friends from different parts of the world. So I use English as a, as a lingua franca with them. All right, so we would start by placing Chris there in the center of the map and then adding notes for Chicago, Memphis, Colombia, and Brazil, and international students and friends all connected to Chris. So that would be a great example. Um, and I will do the same for myself. So I was born in Colorado, but I lived in California, Kansas, and Wisconsin, all different states in the US as I was growing up. So I learned a few different dialects of English. And then in high school, I learned some Spanish and traveled a bit to some Latin American countries. I have friends and family all over the world. Um, I also traveled and studied a bit in Turkey. Um, and I use um, Spanish to communicate with those folks who I've stayed in touch with from my travels in Latin American countries. And I use different dialects of English to stay in touch with my friends and family. So um, that's that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. So for your map, Kate, we would place you at the center and we would add different nodes for all the places and languages that you mentioned, all connected to you. And this visual representation helps us to see the diversity of our linguistic resources and how our language use varies across social contexts. Remember though, this is just a simple example. Your own sociocultural network map 
may be much more complex depending on your personal experiences and connections. The key is to recognize and value the diversity of your linguistic resources and to use this awareness to inform your teaching practices. Yep, that is a great point. And this activity can be adapted for students of all ages and language levels. And it's a way to validate students' multilingual identities and to encourage them to draw on their full linguistic repertoires in the classroom. Well said. Now let's move on to our next activity. We have a quick question from Lorian. How do the social network maps and personal identity wheels contribute to English language learning? How does that help with English language learning or what do you think, Chris? I believe that this could be used once we start examining where we use our own, our first language and our second language. But once we start examining where we're using our languages, we see that it exists in different contexts. Even, you know, as a as an English language speaker and spending that amount of I never really thought about the fact that I was using a different English in school as I was at home or with one group of friends as versus another. Like there's different languages. And so that opens up um, a set of conversations that we can have with our students and it broadens their perspective of the English language. Great, thank you. All right, so moving on to the next activity, making cross-linguistic comparisons. And in this activity, students will compare and contrast linguistic features such as grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation across their home languages and English. This activity requires access to resources on different languages, which could be books or internet resources. Uh, the benefits of this activity are twofold. It not only enhances language learning, but it fosters cultural understanding and appreciation. So diving into this, um, as I mentioned, this one is designed to enhance your metalinguistic awareness by helping you understand how languages can be similar or different. And since I've, I mentioned I've studied Arabic off and on for quite a long time, I've struggled with it, um, we're going to compare some English and Arabic. Now, in terms of grammar, English typically follows a subject-verb-object order, but Arabic can usually follows a verb subject object order, even though it can be in, in change, it can be different. And this is one of those things that I wouldn't have noticed if I wasn't studying or talking about two languages back to back. When I was just studying English, I took the SVO word order sort of for granted because um, I, I thought about it as being normal. Um, in terms of vocabulary, we can see that English uses Latin script and Arabic uses Arabic script, but many words in English have Latin or Greek roots while, and loan words from many different languages, while Arabic words will have Semitic roots and other sources. Um, in terms of pronunciation, English has more consonant clusters, especially with three consonants um, than Arabic does, and word stress in English makes a really big difference. Um, and these are things that I, I don't know that I necessarily would have drawn my, uh, my attention to had I not started comparing both languages, you know, but making these comparisons, we can better understand the unique characteristics of each language and how these differences influence our language learning. And this activity enhances language learning and it fosters cultural understanding and appreciation. All right, so next we have our third activity, exploring idioms from around the world. And in this activity, students will research and share idioms from their home languages and English and discuss their meanings and cultural significance. This activity requires access to resources on idioms, could be books or internet resources. The benefits of this activity are that it not only enriches students' vocabulary, but it fosters intercultural understanding and appreciation. So to move on to this activity, which enriches students vocabulary and fosters intercultural understanding and appreciation. We'll think about idioms, which are phrases or expressions with a figurative or sometimes literal meaning, which differs from the literal meaning of the individual words. They are a fascinating aspect of language as they often reflect cultural nuances and historical context. Here's what I'd like you to do. Present an idiom from your home language or one of your first languages, and then share the idiom with its literal translation and its cultural significance in the chat. This is a great opportunity to learn about the richness and diversity of languages around the world. And remember the benefits of this activity are twofold. It's not only enriches your vocabulary, but fosters intercultural understanding and appreciation. I'm looking forward to seeing some of your idioms. 
All right, everybody, please share your idioms with us. Share maybe the literal translation and the cultural significance if you can. Edison likes the idea because he wrote comparing proverbs and sayings in different languages is, is really helpful as well. Thank you, Edison. And a real quick comment from Fatima who wrote that um, the cross-linguistic comparison is an amazing strategy. Maybe we've done it unintentionally with students, but now awareness is acquired and we can do more. All right, so Hafsa has a nice idiom for us. We might need the direct translation. Otherwise, I don't know if I'm going to do a good job reading it. So go ahead and share us, share with us the uh, literal translation and maybe the cultural significance or the cultural meaning. Um, let's see. Maria says, when a crawdad whistles on the mountain is very similar to when pigs fly, meaning it will never happen. <laughs> That's a good one. Thank you for sharing. All right. I have never heard that one. I have oh, never that's... heard that one. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great one. A drowning man catches at a straw. Interesting from Muhammad. Let us know what that one means. Idioms in English have different meanings in Arabic. Absolutely. The devil is wiser because of his age than his, than his evilness from Carolina. Interesting. Let's see, if anyone hasn't gotten up for the struggle early, he will not awake at noon. Interesting from Bahari. Tell us a little more about that one. Let's see. A tree can't make a forest thick, meaning strength in numbers. I love that one from Tom. Tom, thank you. Full of beams from Haymar, exaggerated behavior. Very good, I love it. Let's see, we're in the pot. It means we're having a problem. It's hard to solve it. It's like we're, we are um, messed up. <laughs> it costs as much as, of, as an eye out of your face it means it's expensive from Rossi. Wonderful, you knocked it out of the park it means you did a great job from Tammy. Anything like else? Bird yeah. in the hand is worth a, is worth two in the bush, and then in Arabic you get ten birds in the bush. So that's uh, the value went up when we translated. <laughs> nice. When chicken will have teeth in my language means when pigs fly. That's another really interesting one. Thank you for sharing. Let's see. Uh, the rice has become porridge is similar to it's no use crying over spilled milk from Ahmad, or there, it's it's no no use crying over rice turning into porridge. Uh, half an orange, meaning having a soulmate. Okay, the other half of your orange from Jose Manuel. Oh, that's romantic. Those are, that's very sweet. Those are, These are all wonderful, everyone. Thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Thank you all. So as we conclude, let's recap the main points of our discussion. We explored the concepts of plurilingualism and translanguaging, how these strategies can be used to enhance language learning. We challenged the traditional view of students' first language as a potential problem, and instead we looked at ways to leverage students' existing linguistic knowledge to enhance their language learning journey. We also discussed various examples and activities that demonstrate the potential of including students' first languages in the language classroom for innovative and nuanced uh, communication. I encourage you to incorporate plurilingual and translanguaging strategies in your teaching. Recognize the value of multiple languages that your students bring to the classroom. Use these languages as resources for learning, not just the target language. This approach can make learning more relevant and more meaningful for your students. Reflect on your own language learning experiences and consider how you could adapt these strategies for your students. We will now open the floor for questions and discussion, and we're eager to hear your thoughts, experiences, and ideas on how we can further promote plurilingualism and translanguaging in our classrooms. Thank you for your active participation and engagement in the session. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. Do you have any other questions for our presenter today before we wrap up? And while you're thinking of any questions you may have, we also would love to hear from you about what activity out of these you might want to incorporate in your classroom. 
please let us know. Let's see. Fatima says, you know, it was a taboo to use L1 in an EFL classroom, but now an approach supports it. And I think she is in favor of that. Wonderful. Um, let's see here. Do you think this is from Lorianne, Chris, another question? Um, who this participant, Lorianne, is afraid that the use of L1 might delay the L2 skills development. Do you agree or, or do you have any comments about that question or concern? I think that we want to recognize it as a tool that we can use. We don't need to, we want to watch out not to over rely on it. Um, but a student doesn't go, just like myself, I don't, when I am speaking Spanish, I don't give up my English. I still have an English language speaker in part of my brain. He'll always be there. So it's helpful for me to recognize when I'm grasping a new concept that I can relate it back to both languages because they're all there. The, the sort of traditional one language or mono, you know, monolingual view of a language classroom would treat it like I was an English language learner and then I was a Spanish you know, language speaker and I wouldn't, I would keep them separate, separated. But this approach recognizes that they're both always going to be there. So that's always kind of a tool for us to use. Thank you so much. All right, let's see here. So what activity out of our activities today would you like to use with your uh, students in your classroom? Um, let's see, a lot of people want to use those idioms. I think we all learned a lot from the idiom sharing. I definitely did. There were some idioms I had never heard before that were really fun and interesting to hear. Let's see. Karen says, thank you. I feel better to use L1 in certain situations. Now I have new ideas to use other activities to make my students understand English better. Great. Hey, Mar says, I would love to use the linguistic inventory as soon as possible. Edison says, we're not erasing languages. We're adding more to the daily school life. How lovely. What a nice comment. Wonderful. Indeed, a great session. A lot of people keep saying they want to use the idioms. I think it's interesting to hear about that. And Patricia says, I want to use them all. Each of the activities are incredibly useful in developing cultural identity and intercultural skills. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. And thanks so much to our wonderful presenter, Chris, today. <laughs> Excuse me for sharing these wonderful ideas. I think we all, yeah, I think that we all um, have some new ideas for leveraging students first or shared local language in the English language classroom. Wonderful.